Very, very interesting, uh, Mark. To kind of shift back to the women part of this um, story, there's been a lot of questions about whether or not fasting affects women differently, you know, different than men, and you know if women if if women um, you know should should fast or if it affects their cycle, menstrual cycle, or hormones like thyroid, things like that. Whether we're talking about like a intermittent fast that's more more um, strong, like longer than time restricted eating, something more like a maybe twenty four to forty eight hour, or pre- perhaps even a more prolonged fast. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, major calorie restriction. So I'll start with animals, then go to humans. So in animals, for example, I had one postdoc, uh, Bronwyn Martin, in that like two thousand five or something, she took rats and she put them on ad libitum feeding, 20% daily calorie restriction, 40% daily calorie restriction, which is a lot, uh, or, uh, or every other day fasting. And she had both males and females. So, and then she followed them over time. And then the females, she, um, essentially did vaginal swab and to do staging of the cycle. And so as far as that goes, the the rats with 20% daily calorie restriction, there was no change in their estrous cycles. The rats with 40% calorie restriction, and this was over a period of like four or six months, they shut down. They stop cycling, and they lost a lot of uh, body fat during over those months. Um, then the rats on every other day fasting, they kept sli- they kept cycling, but there was some increase in irregularity of, of the you know the the timing between the cycles, but they were still presumably fertile. Um, then, what else? She did all sorts of stuff. She tested their learning and memory. Oh, then, interestingly, the males, even on the, the 40% daily calorie restriction, so the males, their sperm count didn't change, and they didn't lose as much body weight as the females during over these months. So then, and then she looked at act like this, the, the activity of the rats moving around the cage and the females, when they're on major calorie restriction, became very active. Like they're moving around the cage a lot, looking for food maybe. <laughs> uh, So my my interpretation of this, and we had like a few sentences in the discussion of the article. uh, Okay, in the wild, if there's animals are getting to the point of starvation, so that would be the 40% calorie restriction. uh, The females, they don't want to get pregnant. Uh, If they get pregnant, there's no food to support, you know, development their baby. So they shut down their cycling. They become more active looking for food. The males, um, the, the males, if, before the males starve to death, it would be advantageous to them to be able to inseminate as many females as possible before they die of starvation. So they stay fertile. So that's my interpretation of that. Um, you know, the female has the egg that's the potential passing the genes on. And, you know, so I don't know. But, and then, but with the intermittent fasting, they kept cycling. And their activity in the cage increased a little bit, but they, they maintained pretty good body fat uh, compared to the 40% calorie restriction. Um, one, one issue is, 
if if and this applies mainly to adolescent girls if an adolescent girl goes to intermittent fasting eating pattern would she be more prone to developing anorexia nervosa which is a, a kind of a obsessive compulsive like psychiatric disorder uh, the answer is we don't know we just don't know um, so from an evolutionary perspective you would think that would be selected against but you know so and it's not clear I guess I, I don't know enough about anorexia and nervosa but you know how back in human recorded history how is anorexia nervosa even common or is this something that has arisen more as girls are more conscious of their body image and so on and you know therefore there's this psychological factor that I don't know if that's something that I guess what I'm saying it doesn't make sense to me that anorexia nervosa would be something that would not be strongly selected against during evolution. Right, because and they these girls often they usually quit cycling too. You know, so yeah. I guess we just don't know. Uh in on the one hand, intuitively you'd say it wouldn't be a good idea to recommend this to adolescent girls, but if they're with obesity or overweight, I don't know. I, we just don't know. I think, I don't know. It seems like it may be okay, but we just don't know. You're talking about with adolescent, adolescent yeah. girls. Well, I, so what about women that are not adolescent and are, you know, do not have an eating disorder and um, are perhaps even normal weight, not obese or overweight? Is there a concern with other hormonal imbalances? I don't even know necessarily. Is it a bad thing? I mean, if you're amenorrhetic for a short period of time um, and you go back to eating normal calories, what does that mean? Do you, do, you, do you delay your reproductive lifespan longer or is there even implications that? Well, um, in animals, that's what happens if – so. For example, if we were to take these rats and do 40% calorie restriction for three months or four, or four months so that they stop cycling and then you put them back, ad libitum feeding, they gain their body weight back, they start cycling. These aren't our studies. These are other studies. Then those rats will be able to have keep cycling uh, to an older age than they would have previously stopped cycling. So in other words, in theory, maybe you could extend age of menopause by <laughs> shutting down cycling for 10 years. I, I don't I, I'm. This is like this. Speculation. <laughs> this is just thinking and not anything yeah, that's approaching it coming close to even encouraging someone to do something like that, which would be crazy. But um, it's an interesting thing to think about. I don't know. Of There haven't been studies where this is a big thing that's lacking in, in this field is studying hormones, except for like simple things like leptin and ghrelin. So for example, um, FSH, LH, um, oxytocin, you know, anything produced. Oh, we do know, do know, in animals anyway, there seems to be increased activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress response system, 
And that's the system that results in increased levels of cortisol. And this was something that was noted early on in the animal studies. The animals live longer when they're on calorie restriction or intermittent fasting, but they have elevated cortisol levels, which is usually, you know, in the clinical arena, that's not a good thing um, because it can suppress the immune system. However, so the animals are living longer. And we did a study, uh, Jay Wan Lee, who was, a, who was a graduate student when I was in Kentucky, and then he came to Baltimore with me when I moved. So this gets a little bit into endocrinology. Cortisol, there's two receptors for cortisol, two proteins inside the cell that bind to cortisol, and those cortisol binding proteins are transcription factors. So cortisol comes from the blood into your cells. It could be a muscle cell, nerve cell, doesn't matter. And they bind to the receptor, and then, which is a transcription factor. It then goes into the nucleus and affects the expression of certain genes. And in fact, the Nobel Prize was given uh, to the person who, jeez, oh, I'm blanking on the name. I should know this. Who discovered uh, this? Okay, there's. So I mentioned there's two receptors for cortisol. One is called the glucocorticoid receptor, or GR. The other is called the mineralocorticoid receptor, or MR. Um, and okay, so. There's been a lot of studies on cortisol in relation to chronic, uncontrollable psychosocial stress. So people who are, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, their work or life situation, they're chronically stressed out, they have elevated cortisol levels. And it's been shown that in that case, in the brain, nerve cells in the brain have a decreased level of one of the cortisol receptors, the MR, and an increase in GR. So the way that the cells are responding to the cortisol is changing, not just the cortisol levels. So uh, we did a study where we measured levels of GR and MR, the two different receptors for cortisol, in the hippocampus of mice that had been on every other day fasting or ad libitum control feeding. And what we found is that in contrast to chronic uncontrollable stress, the intermittent fasting caused a decrease in levels of GR and a sustained level of MR. So, the take-home message is there's increased activation of stress response pathways with intermittent fasting, but the ways your cells respond to the stress is different than the bad ways your cells to respond to bad types of stress, chronic uncontrollable stress. That's really important. That's, that's a very yeah. important point to make.